Letter, Mina Harker to Lucy Wistenra. Budapest, the 24th of August. My dearest Lucy, I know you will be anxious to hear all that has happened since we parted at the railway station at Whitby. Well, my dear, I got to Hull all right and caught the boat to Hamburg and then the train on here. I feel that I can hardly recall anything of the journey, except that I knew I was coming to Jonathan and that as I should have done so nursing, I had better get all the sleep I could. I found my dear one, oh, so thin and pale and weak looking. All the resolution has gone out of his dear eyes and that quiet dignity which I told you was in his face has vanished. He is only a wreck of himself and he does not remember anything that has happened to him for a long time past. At least he wants me to believe so and I shall never ask. He has had some terrible shock and I fear it might tax his poor brain if he were to try and recall it. Sister Agatha, who is a good creature and a born nurse, tells me that he raved of dreadful things whilst he was out of his head. I wanted her to tell me what they were, but she would only cross herself and say she would never tell, that the ravings of the sick were the secrets of God, and that if a nurse thought her vocation should hear them, she should respect her trust. She is a sweet, good soul, and the next day, when she saw I was troubled, she opened up the subject again, and after saying that she could never mention what my poor dear raved about, added, I can tell you this much, my dear, that it was not about anything which he has done wrong himself, and you, as his wife-to-be, have no cause to be concerned. He has not forgotten you or what he owes to you. His fear was of a great and terrible thing, which no mortal can treat um, which no mortal can treat of. I do believe the dear soul thought I might be jealous lest my poor dear should have fallen in love with another girl. The idea of my being jealous about Jonathan. And yet, my dear, let me whisper, I felt a thrill of joy through me when I knew that no other woman was a cause of trouble. I am now sitting by his bedside where I can see his face while he sleeps. He is waking. When he woke, he asked me for his coat as he wanted to get something from the pocket. I asked Sister Agatha, and she brought all his things. I saw that amongst them was his notebook, and was going to ask him to let me look at it, for I knew then that I might find some clue to his trouble. But I suppose he must have seen my wish in my eyes, for he sent me over to the window, saying he wanted to be quiet alone for a moment. Then he called me back, and when I came, he had his hand over the notebook, and he said to me very solemnly, Wilhelmina, I know then that he was in deadly earnest, for he has never called me by that name since he asked me to marry him. You know, dear, my ideas of the trust between husband and wife. There should be no secret, no concealment. I have had a great shock, and when I try to think of what it is, I feel my head spin around, and I do not know if it was all real or the dreaming of a madman. You know I have had brain fever, and that is to be mad. The secret is here, and I do not want to know it. I want to take up my life here with our marriage. For, my dear, we had decided to be married as soon as the formalities are complete. Are you willing, Wilhelmina, to share my ignorance? Here is the book. Take it and keep it. Read it if you will, but never let me know, unless indeed some solemn duty should come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, sane or mad, recorded here. He fell back exhausted, and I put the book under his pillow and kissed him. I have asked Sister Agatha to beg the superior to let our wedding be this afternoon, and am waiting for her reply. She has come and told me that the chaplain of the English Mission Church has been sent for. We are to be married in an hour, or as soon after as Jonathan awakes. Lucy, the time has come and gone. I feel very solemn, but very, very happy. Jonathan woke a little after the hour, and all was ready, and he sat up in bed, propped up with pillows. He answered his I will firmly and strongly. I could hardly speak. My heart was so full that even those words seemed to choke me. The dear sisters were so kind. Please, God, I shall never, never forget them, nor the grave and sweet responsibilities I have taken upon me. I must tell you of my wedding present. When the chaplain and the sisters had left me alone with my husband, oh, Lucy, it is the first time I have written the words, my husband, left me alone with my husband, I took the book from under his pillow and wrapped it in white paper and tied it with a little bit of pale blue ribbon which was around my neck and sealed it over with, um, over the knot with sealing wax. And for my seal, I used my wedding ring. Then I kissed it and showed it to my husband and told him that I would keep it so 
and then it would be an outward and visible sign for all of our lives that we trusted each other, that I would never open it unless it were for his own dear sake or for the sake of some stern duty. Then he took his hand, he took my hand in his, and oh, Lucy, it was the first time he took his wife's hand and said that it was the dearest thing in all the world, and he would go through all the past again to win it, if need be. The poor dear meant to have said a part of the past, but he cannot think of time yet, and I shall not wonder if he fix, if at first he mixes up not only the month, but the year. Well, my dear, what could I say? I could only tell him that I was the happiest woman in all the wide world, and that I had nothing to give him except myself my life and my trust, and that with these went my love and duty for all the days of my life. And my dear, when he kissed me and drew me to him with his poor weak hands, it was like a very solemn pledge between us. Lucy, dear, you do know why I tell you all this. It's not only because it is all sweet to me, but because you have been and are very dear to me. It was my privilege to be your friend and guide when you came from the schoolroom to prepare for the world of life. I want you to see now and with the eyes of a very happy wife, whither duty has led me, so that in your own married life you too may be all happy as I am. My dear, please, almighty God, your life may be all it promises, a long day of sunshine with no harsh wind, no forgetting duty, no distrust. I must not wish you no pain, for that can never be. But I do hope that you will be always as happy as I am now. Good my, goodbye, my dear. I shall post this at once and perhaps write you very soon again. I must stop for Jonathan is waking. I must attend to my husband. Your ever-loving Mina Harker. Letter Lucy Vestendra to Mina Harker. Whitby, the 30th of August. My dearest Mina, oceans of love and millions of kisses. And may you soon be in your own home with your husband. I wish you'd be coming home soon enough to stay here with us. This strong air would soon restore Jonathan. It has quite restored me. I have an appetite like a cormorant, am full of life, and sleep well. You'll be glad to know that I have quite given up walking in my sleep. I think I have not stirred out of my bed for a week. That is, when I once got into it at night. Arthur says I am getting fat. By the way, I forgot to tell you that Arthur is here. We have such walks and drives and rides and rowing and tennis and fishing together, and I love him more than ever. He tells me that he loves me more, but I doubt that. For at first he told me he couldn't love me more than he did then. But this is nonsense. There he is calling to me, so no more just at present from your loving Lucy. P.S. Mother sends her love. She seems better, poor dear. P.P.S. We are to be married on the 28th of September. Dr. Seward's Diary, August 20th. The case of Renfield grows even more interesting. He has now so far quieted that there are spells of cessation from his passion. For the first week after his attack, he was perpetually violent. Then one night, just as the moon rose, he grew quiet and kept murmuring to himself, now I can wait, now I can wait. The attendant came to tell me, so I ran down at once to have a look at him. He was still in the straight waistcoat and in the padded room, but the suffused look had gone from his face and his eyes had something of their old pleading, I might almost say cringing softness. I was satisfied with his present condition and directed him to be relieved. The attendants hesitated, but finally carried out my wishes without protest. It was a strange thing that the patient had humor enough to see their distrust, for, coming close to me, he said in a whisper, all the while looking furtively at them, They think I could hurt you. Fancy me hurting you, the fools. It was soothing somehow to the feelings to find myself dissociated even in the mind of this poor madman from the others. But all the same, I do not follow his thought. Am I to take it that I have anything in common with him, so that we are, as it were, to stand together, or has he to gain from me some good so stupendous that my well-being is needful to him? I must find out later on. Tonight he will not speak. Even the offer of a kitten or even a fully grown cat will not tempt him. He will only say, I don't take any stock in cats. I have more to think of now, and I can wait. I can wait. 
After a while I left him, the attendant tells me that he was quiet until just before dawn, and then that he began to get uneasy and at length violent, until at last he fell into a paroxysm, which exhausted him so that he swooned into a sort of coma. Three nights has the same thing happened, violent all day, then quiet from moonrise to sunset, or to sunrise. I wish I could get some clue to the cause. It would almost seem as if there were some influence which came and went. Happy thought. We shall tonight play sane wits against one against mad ones. He escaped before without our help. Tonight he shall escape with it. We shall give him a chance and have the men ready to follow in case they are required. 23rd of August. The unexpected always happens. How well Disraeli knew life. Our bird, when he found the cage open, would not fly. So all our subtle arrangements went for naught. At any rate, we have proved one thing, that the spells of quietness last a reasonable time. We shall in future be able to ease his bonds for a few hours each day. <laughs> I'm sorry. Brutus, what is happening? My dog is like intensely sniffing a door. Oh, this is almost worse than when I had to let them in and out of the house a hundred times. Oh. We shall in future be able to ease his bonds for a few hours each day. I have given orders to the night attendant merely to shut him in the padded room. When once he is quiet, <laughs> when once he is quiet until an hour before sunrise, the poor soul's body will enjoy the relief even if his mind cannot appreciate it. Hark, the unexpected again. I am called. The patient has once more escaped. Later, another night adventure. Renfield artfully waited until the attendant was entering the room to inspect. Then he dashed out past him and flew down the passage. I sent word for the attendants to follow. Again, he went into the grounds of the deserted house, and we found him in the same place, pressed against the old chapel door. When he saw me, he became furious, and had not the attendant seized him in time, he would have tried to kill me. As we were holding him, a strange thing happened. He suddenly redoubled his efforts, and then, as suddenly, grew calm. I looked round instinctively, but could see nothing. Then I caught the patient's eye and followed it, but could not trace, but could trace nothing as it looked into the moonlit sky except a big bat, which was flapping its silent and ghostly way to the west. Bats usually wheel and flit about, but this one seemed to go on straight, as if it knew where it was bound for or had some intention of its own. The patient grew calmer every instant and presently said, You needn't tie me, I shall go quietly. Without trouble, we came back to the house. I feel there is something ominous in his calm and shall not forget this night. Lucy with Stenra's Diary Hillingham, 21st of August I must imitate Mina and keep writing things down. Then we can have long talks when we do meet. I wonder when it will be. I wish you were with me again, for I feel so unhappy. Last night I seemed to be dreaming again, just as I was at Whitby. Perhaps it is the change of air or getting home again. It is all dark and horrid to me, for I can remember nothing, but I am full of vague fear and feel so weak and worn out. When Arthur came to lunch, he looked quite grieved when he saw me and I hadn't the spirit to try to be cheerful. I wonder if I could sleep in mother's room tonight. I shall make an excuse and try. 25th of August, another bad night. Mother did not seem to take to my proposal. She seems not too well herself, and doubtless she fears to worry me. I tried to keep awake and, and succeeded for a while, but when the clock struck 12, it waked me from a doze, so I must have fallen asleep. There was a sort of scratching or flapping at the window. But I did not mind, and as I remember no more, I suppose I must have fallen asleep. More bad dreams. I wish I could remember them. This morning I am horribly weak. My face is ghastly pale and my throat pains me. It must be something wrong with my lungs, for I don't seem ever to get air enough. I shall try to cheer up when Arthur comes, or else I know he will be miserable and so when he sees me. Letter. Arthur Holmwood to Dr. Seward. Seward. Abelmar Hotel, 31st of August. My dear Jack, I want you to do me a favor. Lucy is ill. That is, she has no special disease, but she looks awful and is getting worse every day. 
I have asked her if there is any cause, I do not dare ask her mother, for to disturb the poor lady's mind about her daughter in her present state of health would be fatal. Mrs. Wistenra has confided to me that her doom is spoken, disease of the heart. Though poor Lucy does not know it yet, I am sure that there is something preying on my dear girl's mind. I am most distracted when I think of her. To look at her gives me a pang. I told her I should ask you to see her, and though she demurred at first, I know why, old fellow, she finally consented. It will be a painful task for you, I know, old friend, but it is for her sake, and I must not hesitate to ask, or you to act. You are to come to lunch at Hillingham tomorrow, two o'clock, so as not to arouse any suspicion in Mrs. Wistenra, and after lunch Lucy will take an opportunity to, of being alone with you. I shall come in for tea, and we can go away together. I am filled with anxiety, and want to consult with you alone as soon as I can, after you have seen her. Do not fail, Arthur. Telegram, Arthur Holmwood to Dr. Seward. 1st of September. Am summoned to see my father, who is worse. Am writing. Write me fully by tonight's post to ring. Wire me if necessary. Letter from Dr. Seward to Arthur Holmwood, 2nd of September. My dear old fellow, with regard to Mrs. Wistenra's health, I hasten to let you know at once that in my opinion there is not any functional disturbance or any malady that I know of. At the same time, I am not by any means satisfied with her appearance. She is woefully different from what she was when I saw her last. Of course, you must bear in mind that I did not have full opportunity of examination, such as I should wish. Our very friendship makes a little difficulty which not even medical science or custom can bridge over. I had better tell you exactly what happened, leaving you to draw, in a measure, your own conclusions. I shall then say what I have done and proposed doing. I found Mrs. Wistenra in seemingly gay spirits. Her mother was present, and in a few seconds I made up my mind that she was trying all she knew to mislead her mother and prevent her from being anxious. I have no doubt she guesses, if she does not know, what need of caution there is. We lunched alone, and as we all exerted ourselves to be cheerful, we got, as some kind of reward for our labors, some full cheerfulness amongst us. Then Miss Wissandra went to lie down, and Lucy was left with me. We went into her boudoir, and till we got there her gaiety remained, for the servants were coming and going. As soon as the door was closed, however, the mask fell from her face, and she sank down into a chair with a great sigh, and hid her eyes with her hand. When I saw her high spirits had failed, I at once took advantage of her reaction to make a diagnosis. She said to me very sweetly, I cannot tell you how I loathe talking about myself. I reminded her that a doctor's confidence was sacred, but that you were grievously anxious about her. She caught on to my meeting at once and settled that matter in a word. Tell Arthur everything you choose. I do not care for myself, but all for him, so I am quite free. I could easily see that she is somewhat bloodless, but I could not see the usual anemic signs, and by a chance I was able to test the quality of her blood, for in opening a window, which was stiff, a cord gave way and she cut her hand slightly with broken glass. It was a slight matter in hand, but it gave me an evident chance, and I secured a few drops of the blood and have analyzed them. The qualitative anal analysis gives a quite normal condition, and shows, I should infer, in itself a vigorous state of health. In other physical matters, I was quite satisfied that there is no need for anxiety, but as there must be a cause somewhere, I have come to the conclusion that it must be something mental. She complains of difficulty in breathing, satisfactorily at times, and of heavy lethargic sleep with dreams that frighten her, but regarding which she can remember nothing. She says that as a child, she used to walk in her sleep and that when it would be, the habit came back and that once she walked out in the night and went to the East Cliff, where Mrs. Murray found her, but she assures me that of late the habit has not returned. I am in doubt, and so have done the best thing I know of. I have written to my old friend and master, Professor Van Helsing of Amsterdam, who knows as much about obscure diseases as anyone in the world. I have asked him to come over, and as you told me that all things were to be at your charge, I have mentioned to him who you are and your relation to Miss Wistenra. This, my dear fellow, is only in obedience to your wishes, for I am only too proud and happy to do anything I can for her. Van Helsing would, I know, do anything for me for a personal reason. So, no matter on what ground he comes, we must accept his wishes. He is a seemingly arbitrary man, but this is because he knows what he is talking about better than anyone else. 
He is a philosopher and metaphysician and one of the most advanced scientists of his day, and he has, I believe, an absolutely open mind. This, with an iron nerve, a temper of the ice brook, an indomitable resolution, self-command and toleration exalted from virtues to blessings, and the kindliest and truest heart that beats. These form his equipment for the noble work that he is doing for mankind, work both in theory and practice, for his views are as wide as his all-embracing sympathy. I tell you these facts that you may know why I have such confidence in him. I have asked him to come at once. I shall see Miss Westenner tomorrow again. She is to meet me at the stores, so that I may not alarm her mother by too early a repetition of my call. Yours only, John Seward. Well, we got Van Helsing invited into the mix now. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, Van Helsing also carries the same name as Bram Stoker, which was Abraham. Letter, Abraham Van Helsing, MD, D, PH, D, Lit, etc., etc., to Dr. Seward, 2nd of September. My good friend, when I received your letter, I am already coming to you. By good fortune, I can leave just at once without wrong to any of those who have trusted me. Were fortune other than it were bad for those who have trusted me. For I come to my friend when he call me to aid those he holds dear. Tell your friend that when the ti that time you suck from my wound so swiftly the poison of the gangrene from the knife that our other friend too nervous let slip, you did more for him when he wants my aid, and you call for them than all his great and you call for them than all his great fortune could do. But it is pleasure added to do for him, your friend. It is to you that I come. Have then rooms for me at the Great Eastern Hotel, so that I may be near to hand, and please it so arrange that we may see the young lady not too late on tomorrow, for it is likely that I may have to return here that night, but if need be I shall come again in three days, and stay longer if it must. Till then goodbye, my friend John Van Helsing. Letter Dr. Seward to the Honorable Arthur Holmwood. 3rd of September. My dear Art, Van Helsing has come and gone. He came on with me to Hillingham and found that, by Lucy's discretion, her mother was lunching out, so that we were alone with her. Van Helsing made a very careful examination of the patient. He is to report to me and I shall advise you, for of course I was not present all the time. He is, I fear, much concerned, but says he must think. When I told him of our friendship and how you trust to me in the matter, he said, you must tell him all you think. Tell him what I think, if you can guess it, if you will say. Nay, I am not jesting. This is no jest, but life and death perhaps. Um, perhaps more. I asked what he meant by that, for he was very serious. This was when we had come back to town, and he was having a cup of tea before starting on his return to Amsterdam. He would not give me any further clue. You must not be angry with him, Art, because his very reticence means that all his brains are working for her good. He will speak plainly enough when the time comes, be sure. So I told him I would simply write an account of our visit, just as if I were doing a descriptive special article for the Daily Telegraph. He seems not to notice, but remarked that the smuts in London were not quite so bad as they used to be when he was a student here. I am to get his report tomorrow if he can possibly make it. In any case, I am to have a letter. Well, as to the visit, Lucy was more cheerful than on the day I first saw her, and certainly looked better. She had lost something of the ghastly look that so upset you, and her breathing was normal. She was very sweet to the professor, as she always is, and tried to make him feel at ease, though I could see that the poor girl was making a hard struggle for it. I believe Van Helsing saw it too, for I saw the quick look under his bushy brows that I knew of old. Then he began to chat of all things except ourselves and diseases, and with such an infinite geniality that I could see poor Lucy's pretense in animation merge into reality. Then, without any seeming change, he brought the conversation gently round to his visit and suavely said, My dear young miss, I have the so great pleasure because you are much beloved. That is much, my dear. 
even where there that which I do not see. They told me you were down in the spirit and that you were in a ghastly pale. To them I say, poof, and he snapped his fingers at me and went on. But you and I shall show them how wrong they are. How can he, and he pointed at me with the same look and gesture as that with which he once pointed me out to, on his classes, on or rather after a peculiar occasion which he never fails to remind me of, know anything of a young lady's. He has his madmans to play with and to bring them back to happiness and to those that love him. It is much to do and oh, but there are rewards in that we can bestow such happiness. But the young ladies, he has no wife nor daughter and the young do not tell themselves of the young. Um, but to the old like me who have known so many sorrows and the causes of them. So my dear, we will send him away to smoke the cigarette in the garden whilst you and I have little talk all to ourselves. I took the hint and strolled about, and presently the professor came to the window and called me in. He looked grave but said, I have made careful examination, but there is no functional cause. With you I agree that there has been much blood lost. It has been but is not. But the condition of her are in no way anemic. I have asked her to send me her maid, and I may ask just one or two questions that so I may not chance to miss nothing. I know well what she will say, and yet there is cause. There is always cause for everything. I must go back home and think. You must send to me the telegram every day, and if there be cause, I shall come again. The disease, for not to be all well is a disease, interest me, and the sweet young dear, she interests me too. She charm me, and for her, if not for you or disease, I come. As I tell you, he would not say a word more, even when we were alone. And so now, Art, you know all I know. I shall keep stern watch. I trust your poor father is rallying. It must be a terrible thing to you, my dear old fellow, to be placed in such a position between two people who are both so dear to you. I know your idea of duty to your father, and you are right to stick to it. But if need be, I shall send you word to come at once to Lucy. So do not be over anxious unless you hear from me. Dr. Seward's Diary, 4th of September. Zufagus' patient still keeps up our interest in him. He had only one outburst, and that was yesterday at an unusual time. Just before the stroke of noon, he began to grow restless. The attendant knew the symptoms and at once summoned aid. Fortunately, the men came at a run and were just in time, for at the stroke of noon he became so violent that it took all their strength to hold him. In about five minutes, however, he began to get more and more quiet, and finally sank into a sort of melancholy, in which state he has remained up to now. The attendant tell me that his screams whilst in the paroxysm were really appalling. I found my hands full when I got in, attending to some of the other patients who were frightened by him. Indeed, I can quite understand the effect, for the sounds disturbed even me, though I was some distance away. It is now after the dinner hour at the asylum, and as yet my patient sits in a corner brooding, with a dull, sullen, woebegone look in his face, which seems rather to indicate than to show something directly. I cannot quite understand it. Later, another change in my patient. At five o'clock I looked in on him and found him seemingly as happy and contented as he used to be. He was catching flies and eating them, and was keeping note of his capture by making nail marks on the edge of the door between the ridge of padding. When he saw me, he came over and apologized for his bad conduct and asked me in a very humble, cringing way to be led back to his own room and to have his notebook again. I thought it well to humor him, so he is back in his room with the window open. He has the sugar of his tea spread on the windowsill and is reaping quite a harvest of flies. He is not now eating them, but putting them in a box as of old and is already examining the corners of his room to find a spider. I tried to get him to talk about the past few days, for any clue to his thoughts would be of immense help to me, but he would not rise. For a moment or two, he looked very sad and said in a sort of faraway voice, as though saying it rather to himself than to me, all over, all over. He has deserted me. No hope for me now unless I do it for myself. Then suddenly, turning to me in a resolute way, he said, Doctor, won't you be very good to me and let me have a little more sugar? I think it would be good for me. 
And the flies, I said, yes, the flies like it too. And I like the flies, therefore I like it. And there are people who know so little as to think that madmen do not argue. I procured him a double supply and left him as happy a man as I suppose any in the world. I wish I could fathom his mind. Midnight. Another change in him. I had been to see Miss Vestenra, whom I found much better and had just returned and was standing at our own gate looking at the sunset, when once more I heard him yelling. As his room is on this side of the house, I could hear it better than in the morning. It was a shock to me to turn from the wonderful smoky beauty of a sunset over London, with its lurid lights and the inky shadows and all the marvelous tints that come on foul clouds, even as on foul water, and to realize all the grim sternness in my own cold stone building, with its wealth of breathing misery and my own desolate heart to endure it all. I reached him just as the sun was going down, and from his window saw the red disk sink. As it sank, he became less and less frenzied, and just as it dipped, he slid from the hands that held him an inert mass on the floor. It is wonderful, however, what intellect recuperative power lunatics have, for within a few minutes he stood up quite calmly and looked around him. I signaled for the attendants not to hold him, for I was anxious to see what he would do. He went straight over to the window and brushed out the crumbs of sugar. Then he took his fly box and emptied it outside and threw away the box. Then he shut the window and, crossing over, sat down on his bed. All this surprised me, so I asked him, Are you not going to keep flies any more? No, he said, I'm sick of all that rubbish. He certainly is a wonderfully interesting study. I wish I could get some glimpse of his mind, or of the cause of his sudden passion. Stop. There may be a clue after all, if we can find why today his paroxysm came at high noon and at sunset. Can it be that there is a malign influence of the sun at periods, which affects certain natures, as at times the moon does others? We shall see. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. 4th of September, patient still better today. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. 5th of September, patient greatly improved, good appetite, sleeps naturally, good spirits, color coming back. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam, 6th of September. Terrible change for the worse. Come at once. Do not lose an hour. I hold over telegram to Holmwood till I have seen you.